Hey everyone, Gerard Scarpese here, co-founder of the Hairbrain Community, back with our Professionals Who Practice series for our good friends at Pivot Point. Today I'll be sharing with you some short textured razor cutting on, uh, on our men's mannequin here, the coal, um, which is great because it's something I really don't do a lot of. You know, the whole idea of the series is to practice. And I truly am a ladies hairdresser. I'd say, you know, 99% of what I do is uh, on women's hair. So I do have a few male clients and sometimes I do some male models. Um, and I'd say for the past couple of years, we've really been working on very groomed, classic, almost 1950s type work. I think you guys know what I mean. Short back and sides and really kind of groomed, clean shapes and partings. Um, so it's been a while since I've done more of a textured kind of rocker kind of men's look. And uh, just like anything, you know they're going to come back into fashion. Um, and I'm seeing some of it already on, actually I see it a lot on barbers who are starting to change up their own look and go into more of these textured looks. So what I'm doing here is working across the top of Cole's head, uh, across the kind of the parietal plate with horizontal sections and just getting a square line. You're going to hear me say square a lot today. It's one of the, you know, kind of key principles of men's shape and one of the differences to me between shorter women's hair and shorter men's hair is that, you know, it's a bit squarer, leaner, the corners are stronger. Um, so I'll be talking about that a lot. Just bringing this straight up, working with what I call backhand razoring, where I turn the razor around back so that I can work up with the blade into the grain of the hair. And again, you can tell it's working if you're getting support. Uh, you're getting enough texture to for the hair support itself. Obviously, choosing the right length is, is crucial because if the hair just sticks up or is it uncontrollable, that, uh, that can be kind of a fail. So, you know, a long time ago, I got a great tip. Uh, maybe Kelly, you can come in and see this. Kelly's behind the camera. I lift the hair straight up from the head at the crown where it's most likely to be jumpy. Yeah. And then I let it fall. And the shortest place I can cut it and be guaranteed that I won't get anything too pokey is the first place where it hits the head. So that's where I'm going to go with this. Um, if I'm going to do shorter than that, then I have to be aware that it might get really pokey, it might get short, I might have to do things to try to help to control it, or there might be nothing I can do to control it. So with this particular look, you know, I, I wanted a shorter men's look, but not completely kind of barbered and faded. You know, the other question some of you might be wondering why I'm starting on the top. I, in general, when I'm working with shorter ladies or men's hair, if I can, I like to start on the top because I think, you know, this, this, the sides in the back, um, obviously they're important, but the real style comes from the top. And for the reason that I just said, getting the right length for the texture and really just making sure it's going to complement that person and be really suitable, I think the key point there is to start from the top. So if you're watching and you have any questions, we've got Kelly and Courtney um, here and they're both on their phones. I'd love to take your questions. Once again, if you're just joining, I'm Gerard Scarpese, and I'm here with our Professionals Who Practice series, sponsored by our good friends at Pivot Point. It's where I get this great male mannequin and this incredible universal tripod. All right, awesome. Just want to say hello and good morning to everyone who's watching, Pina, Jay, Greg, Rose, Colleen, everyone here, welcome. Thanks, guys. So as I get to the front, I, don't, I, I know I'm going to have a kind of a textured front, so I am leaning forward a little bit. I'm keeping my fingers square, but I'm not over directing back. So I'll turn the mannequin a little bit to the side, which I can do easily with my universal swivel tripod. I don't have to lift the whole thing. And maybe you can see from the side here how it's more on base. I was kind of straight up to the ceiling until I reached the forehead or the frontal bone area. And then I started to kind of Again, come a little bit forward with it so that I don't build too much weight at the front because I'm going to go for kind of a textured, broken, serrated feeling at the face. Again, I want to, you know, this whole idea of this series is professionals who practice. And I don't do a lot of men's haircutting in general, but the, what I have been doing and what I think most of us have been doing recently is really sculpted kind of stronger men's shapes that are a bit more, shall we say, 1950s inspired. We're here, you know, I'm going a little bit more kind of Brit rock or Brit pop kind of, uh, you think of Oasis or that kind of a look, kind of a men's textured crop. 
and I'm using my straight edge razor. This is uh, our new wood handled razor designed by, uh, by Hairbrained and myself here. You can see that's a beautiful pale wood and it's got a really graceful curve. I prefer to work with the straight edge razor. I feel like it gives me more flexibility. This has a, temp has a guard that you can slide over it if for whatever reason you prefer to work with a guard, but you still get that balance and that flex. And here what I'm doing on the top is what's called backhand razoring. And I think some of you maybe um, would like to try this. So I'm gonna walk you through. I take my section. I've got my razor locked and loaded for safety. So that's what I'm doing here. My pointer finger wraps around it. I'm bringing this hair straight up to the ceiling. Now Kelly, step back a little bit. You can see the razor's in a normal position here. All I do to come back in is just bring the blade to the ceiling and I try to cut with the grain of the hair. So just like that, if my hand's not there, I'm just doing that. And once you get comfortable with that, there's lots of variations of texturizing, weight removal, um, and ways to cut overhand. As I get through the underneath, I'll go into a more traditional technique where I cut kind of more razor towards my knuckles. Um, obviously, you know, safety first, you need to really be versed and have control with the blade here because it is an unguarded blade, which I like because I love the sharpness and control that it gives me. Awesome. I just want to take a moment and say hello to all the different countries out there watching, uh, Mexico, Russia, India. Um, wow, thanks, guys. you guys, for tuning thanks in. Thanks for joining us, and uh, thanks to Pivot Point for always supporting quality education in our industry. We've been working on this series. We started it about a year ago where we get different artists who are, you know, somewhat accomplished already as educators, as artists, as salon owners. And the message here is in our craft, you have to keep practicing, you know, and a great way to do that that um, basically takes away all the pressure is, is to do it on a high quality mannequin like the Cole mannequin here. I've been doing it for nearly 30 years when I have a new idea or I feel like maybe I'm getting a little rusty at something, um, I'll get a great mannequin from Pivot Point and I'll practice. And the truth is the majority of the classes that I teach, people prefer to learn on mannequins as well because it takes a lot, it changes the timing, it takes a lot of the pressure out and it gives you a great chance to practice without having to worry about anything. Sylvia was wondering, um, let me see, I know Sylvia was asking about the, this compared to the feather razor. Okay, so Feather makes quite a few razors. One of them is a folding razor called the Feather Plie. The HB Pro Razor takes Feather Plie blades because they're the best in the business. Um, the razor that most people consider a feather is called the Feather Styling Razor, which is kind of just a stick. It doesn't fold and it comes with a guarded blade. And if you're comfortable with that, go for it. I find I have more flexibility because of the fold in the handle. Um, it gives me a lot more sensitivity. And over the years of razor cutting, I've really kind of grown to prefer an unguarded blade. And Sergio was wondering, are you pivoting now with your sections? No, my sections were really simple. Just horizontal sections through the top, uh, razor cut square. So that's my basic shape on the top. It'll be a lot more detailing to do, but there's a lot of hair to get through here to get this square shape in. So now I want to move to the back. I'm going to redamp the hair. I don't like to razor hair that's too dry. I find that especially with an unguarded blade, which is very sharp, it'll pull the hair. Um, and even if it doesn't damage it, it can be uncomfortable for the client. So that's one of my, uh, if, you, if you like cutting dry, you know, I never try to judge how anyone does anything if it works for you. But for me, dry razoring I found pulls the hair. And I've, I've asked clients about it because I obviously do a lot of razor cutting. And lots of people have told me it, it feels like it's hurting them. But if, if it's fine for you, then go for it. And I believe uh, Sergio just must have missed the, our, our hairline. Um, he's wondering if you are leaving length towards the hairline. I am not leaving length towards the hairline. I'll come back to the top a little bit later. And this whole haircut, I'm actually trying to, you know, sit the hairlines in a little bit. And there'll be more freehand work around it later. So the idea is to have a nice textured layer internally. And then... I'll go back and using twisting and slicing and some freehand razor techniques to remove excess weight. So there's a pivot point here, great segue. Everything that was brought up, straight up to the ceiling and cut square, now pivots back and there's a pivot point right in the middle there. This point is the last point of the top and the first point of the back. And what happens is it's cut going straight up to the ceiling and then cut going straight back to the wall and that helps me build corners in the shape, which is one of the things 
that help keep it a little bit more of a masculine short shape. I mean, let's be honest, there's subtle differences between men's and women's short hair, especially if you're not going, you know, really barbered. And let's be honest, plenty of women can go really barbered too. But some of the things, you know, that are meant to complement the male bone structure are a little bit more squareness in your shape. Again, a generalization, not a rule. Now, as I work my way around through the sides, I am literally going to move my body with it. I don't want to build a lot of squareness this way. So it's really just square on the top, connecting to the side, connecting to the back. But around the underneath, I'm really going to follow the head shape. So this is really good practice in your body position and control. Take fine sections. This may be a little bit high for me. Tilt the head forward and away. Make sure that I'm maintaining my corner at the top, which is right here. Here's my pivot point, top, back, and sides. Keep my fingers square to the head, so nice flat plane, and working with edge cutting here. I want a chunky texture. Uh, for those of you that are interested in razor craft, there's lots of different ways to manipulate the razor. I've decided here that I want a chunky texture. I don't want a kind of airy or kind of blended texture like when I do razor graduation. I'm cutting with the blade more perpendicular to my fingers. Pina was uh, mentioning that she finds the razor um, difficult to use on clients because of past experiences. Um, how, how do you think about that? How, how does she get around I that? I think if a client has a bad experience with a the razor, then I tell them I'm happy to use scissors. I don't have time to get into people's mind, especially when I'm just meeting them. So if anybody ever says, hey, I'd like this and this and this in my haircut and I don't like razor cuts, I say, great, no problem, I'll give you a scissor cut. If people don't mention what kind of tool they like or don't like, and I think it's a good time to use a razor, I pick up my razor and I start cutting with my razor. And I honestly have never had anyone in 30 years of cutting say to me at that point, don't use a razor, I really haven't. But I can understand that it might happen to some people. And if someone said to me, hey, I'd prefer if you don't use a razor, I'd pick up a scissor. You know, because I think if you're a professional who practices, you're comfortable with the scissor, the razor, the clipper, uh, but the one thing I don't try to do is convince someone to have something that they've just asked me they don't want. I, I just think it's a, for me, it's a losing proposition in the salon. All right. Just want to say some community hellos to Milo. Um, how you doing? And Michael Snyder says hello. What's up, Michael? We were just talking about you. And he says the doll head looks like Brandon Lee. Yeah, he does look like Brandon Lee, yeah. All right, so I, as I pointed out, I'm working square. All my edges are hey, still Dara. a little bit long, and I want that at this point because as I come in later, I'm going to do twisting and slicing and, you know, try to give it a kind of a rocker edge to it. Again, for me, I'm a professional who practices, and it's really been a couple of years of doing really, really strong men's haircuts, much more scissor over comb, clipper over comb, hard parts. So I wanted to, you know, when I knew I had a chance today to practice, I was like, what's something I haven't really done a lot of lately? And that was kind of like a short textured men's haircut. And I'll be honest, I'm seeing a lot of like the kind of cool barbers uh, themselves growing their hair out a little bit into these kind of shapes. So the, a lot of the guys who were really brought back that renaissance of classic barbering are now looking at different genres, you know. And I think that that's what happens. You know, we kind of were reflecting kind of a 50s genre. And now maybe we're moving a little bit more into a 60s or mod genre. But it's really all up to the individual. Hey, uh, Dara, I hear you. Uh, send me an email and we'll get you one. So working my way through, you can see, if you look at the profile here, Cal, that there's weight in the crown. So literally, I've cut a line this way, this way, and this way. And where those two match up, the longest point of this haircut right now is the crown. Um, which, for a lot of reasons, makes sense on a short men's haircut if you don't want this to stick up straight. Um, and it also gives a leaner more square shape. As I work around here though, I've chosen to follow the head shape through from the back uh, because I'm not, I don't really wanna build a corner behind the ear for this shape. As I get forward, my sections get a little bit diagonal just for comfort in front of the ear. I'm working with a fingertip control and an edge cutting technique. So that means my blade is perpendicular to my fingers. This will give a really kind of chunkier texture rather than some of the other rotations that might happen with the razor. Notice as I get to the edge, I do what I call peeling. When I want something a little shorter on the edge, I don't, you know, because if I keep it out square, I'm gonna have more hair here than I need. So I just peel my way through. 
You know, what's nice about this Cole mannequin is the hairlines, I noticed as I was kind of checking it through, they're a little less dense. So it's great for practicing. Just like most people's hairlines, you know, the hair tends to get a little bit less dense right on the edge. And the same thing happens with the way that these um, hairs are implanted on this pivot point Cole mannequin. So a great, realistic thing to practice on. Getting into the connection between the front and the temple. You know, I, I, in the past, I, you know, I actually started out as a barber. My first license was a barbering license. Um, and in the past, I've worked on men's curriculums. It's just really been the past, you know, eight, eight or so years that I haven't done a lot of men's cutting. But uh, one of the things that I got to do in my career that I was really proud of was work with my buddy, Kurt Kiefner, um, who's a men's, uh, he's been the men's cutting guru, guru even before it was kind of a super popular thing to do. And uh, he, one of the things I loved about Kurt was, I still love it about Kurt, was language. He's like, we never call this bangs on men. We call it the front. And it's like little things like that, you know, because it's like, you know, who has bangs, uh, you know, children and, and women. That was just his. But it's always stuck in my head, and I always call this the front of a men's haircut, not the bangs or the fringe. All right. So Kayla's here with us, and she says, uh, is it true that you cannot use a razor on hair that was bleached, uh, processed with lightener? Uh, no, it's not true. It's a case-by-case -case basis, um, and the only way to find out is to cut a few sections and see how the hair responds. What are you looking uh, for when you say response? We're looking to see that it doesn't just kind of disintegrate. I mean, first of all, any hair that's damaged, uh, your best bet is to just cut it blunt with scissors. Don't even texturize it with scissors because it's just going to look thinner and more damaged. So, and also, you know... If you were afraid to do chemical processes on it or anything like that, if the hair is damaged or weak, but if it's been, let's say, uh, high lifted, but it's been protected with a great product, like let's say Olaplex, then feel free. You know, if that hair is healthy, you can, um, you can totally do it. You can work on any type of hair. I, I, I feel comfortable working on pretty much any type of hair with the razor, unless I don't like the way that it reacts. I think of the razor very often like, like bleach or lightener. Um, sometimes, you know, if the hair ha doesn't have integrity, it definitely can make it shatter. If the hair does have integrity, then it can be one of the most beautiful things you can do. But ultimately, it's up to the hairdresser to understand the hair and also understand the rotation of the blade. The way that I'm using the blade now um, would be the least challenging to the texture. So I'm doing what's called edge cutting. So I'm cutting with the grain and small, clean cuts. The more flat you are, which is cutting basically with the blade parallel to your fingers, that can be super aggressive. But again, once you learn all the rotations and controls, it's really up to you. You know, just like, uh, like any kind of chemical product, it's up to the professional to understand when it can be applied. And Simone was wondering if you can remind us the make and model of this mannequin, please. This is a Pivot Point Cole mannequin. They're available at Pivot Point Shop. And what we're doing here is working on the Professionals Who Practice series, and I'm Gerard Scorpese, and I'll be honest with you, in the past few years, I haven't done a lot of men's cutting. I've really focused on women's cutting. Um, I do have just a few male clients, and I've done a few uh, men's haircuts at shows, and they've definitely been much more barbered-looking shapes. So it's been a while since I've done something that's got this kind of rocker edge or texture to it or kind of a mod look. Um, so that's what I wanted to practice today. And can you talk to us about the sections you're taking? Um, yep, they're so just, right now they're just vertical. Not diagonal. Um, they get a little diagonal in the bottom. You know, think of them as curvilinear. So, you know, the head is, it, it's got a little curve going that way. Just a tiny little bit of curve to work with the head. It's like trying to draw a straight line on a balloon. So you can see there, it curves in just a tiny bit. And what that does, especially with my big hands, it allows me to come in a little bit on a diagonal as I try to sit and peel the bottom off. Because the, cat, the head is pronounced in the occipital bone, if I cut this totally flat right now, I'll have, I have some hair here that I'm going to work on, but if I cut it totally flat and didn't sit in, I have a lot. And it would look a little bit like uh, Burt Reynolds in the 70s, you know? Be a little bit kind of, not quite a mullet, but going in that direction. So I am curving a little bit towards the bottom. I'm not over, I'm using this top point again. This is the corner from the top. I cut a square line. I pivot back. Then I'm kind of on base, using that as a reference point and cutting square to the head 
until I reach through to about the bottom of the ear. So square to the head means my line is square. It's not totally following the head. Then about from mid ear or bottom ear in, I do curve in a little bit to sit the hairlines in. And you'll notice I use a peeling technique. So what that means is my hand literally pulls away as I raise her. This allows my stroke to get larger and for me to get more texture because eventually I'm gonna really dial that hairline in. Tilt the head away from me. I'm gonna drop cold down a little bit. Now I'm gonna keep working through vertical with a little curve at the bottom until I get to the front of the ear. Then I go a little more diagonal to meet up with the front of the cut. Again, if you guys have any questions about anything at all, I'd love to hear them. I uh, love to have a little dialogue with you. I know people are watching from all over the world. Um, I wonder if you guys have had the same experience as me that it's probably been about four or five years now that hair, men's hair has been really kind of groomed and barbered traditionally. I wonder if you're starting to see uh, any change, if people are coming back in and asking for texture. And if so, do you think uh, it's time to, to push that trend? Tristan Morrison just tuned in. My good buddy Tristan. Tristan's been doing great uh, education for many years. And then in the past year or so, he's done a lot of great Hairbrain Lives on Facebook for us. So if you guys, if you are just joining us and maybe you don't know, through our Hairbrain Facebook page, we've got over 300 of these instructional videos um, shot like this in an iPhone that you can watch at any time. And if you love that, you're really going to love hblive.me, which is our online education platform that's shot in a beautiful studio with six cameras and cranes. And we just started that. And so far, we've had a class from myself, Sharon Blaine, Julian Perlingero, Lupe Voss. And special announcement, the next three educators are going to be Jay Wesley Olson, Chad Kenyon, and DJ Muldoon. So keep your eyes peeled on hblive.me. And if you haven't seen it before, and you really want accessible, incredible, and affordable education that really takes the production quality to the next level, you know, because here we're just shooting with an iPhone. We've got some lights and stuff, but we want to make sure you guys can have the best true academy experience possible. Right? You can get that at hblive.me. Simona was wondering um, if you can walk us through if the hair was curly, if this men's hair was curlier than just... Uh, to be honest with you, I would cut the same way. Uh, because edge cutting works well on curly hair for me. The only thing different was I have to judge the lengths of the curl, you know, because when you cut curl, you cut to either an S or a C, so you think about the pattern. It's either got to be short enough that it's a C or long enough that it's an S. If it's in between there, that's kind of when you get maybe uncooperative curl, but I personally feel pretty comfortable razoring hair, especially short hair, and it all just depends on the rotation of the blade. I don't do any flat razoring on really curly hair because I can find that it um, makes it a bit frizzy, makes it hard to control. But that doesn't mean that I don't ever do it, to be honest with you. Anytime you say never in hairdressing, you're limiting yourself, you know, because uh, things change, tools change, techniques change, and you don't want to get stuck. So most of the time, I don't do a lot of flat razoring on curly hair, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I cut channels into it. Harris has a great question. Uh, okay. Who would you say your British hairdressing inspirations are? Uh, in terms of hairdressers? Yes. I mean, you know, I'm fortunate. I started off with, you know, the cream of the crop. I worked at Vidal Sassoon for the first 10 years of my career. And um, obviously Vidal, Roger Thompson, Christopher Brooker, even though they were before my time, their uh, influence was never ending. Um, you know, and then from there, Tim Hartley was the creative director of Sassoon at the time. Um, and he was an influence. And then I have to say Mark Hayes, who's taken over, uh, an incredible influence. And then, you know, many of my contemporaries who are people that I taught with and, you know, um, that I learned from, like Richard Ashforth and um, uh, Stacey Broughton, a lot of incredible educators there. Um, so tons. I mean, I also, I, I really, once I left Sassoon and I, I got more into um, working in a salon, I wasn't working in an academy anymore. I really got hooked on Tony and Guy education because for me it was a great combination of technique and um, looseness and sex appeal, which was great in the salon. You know, and then let's not forget, you know, all the great American educators, you know, um, that have come through the years. And of course, one of those being Leo Passage, the founder of Pivot Point, who left us this incredible legacy of education, training, educational tools. 
Um, so there's just so many, you know, there's so many great inspirations out there. Who are you? Who are your inspirations, I wonder? So pivoting a little bit on a diagonal to build some weight here, obviously in the recession area. Um, and then I'll have my basic shape in. I will then switch to the scissor for a few minutes just to cross check and refine and do some detail work. I do a lot of combination scissor razor work. Um, and very often I'll get the shape in with the razor so it's a little bit more loose and soft, which I like. And then I'll do some detail work with the scissor. And then I'll probably go back and do some finished detail work again with the razor. So mm -hmm. switching off to the scissor right now. You're, uh, you're an old student of yours, Maite, is tuned in. Oh, wonderful. Nice to, to have you here. I she hope says, I did you well in class. She says you and Julian were instructors in Santa Monica. Okay, you're probably still recovering from that experience. She says Anthony Wascolo is her is her oh, inspiration. Without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt. Alongside Joshua geniuses. Wood. So cross-checking through here, I cut the top with the razor horizontally, checking it with the scissor vertically. And obviously the idea here is not to have to change the shape, but to just make sure that it's on track and maybe break it up a little bit more. And there shouldn't be a lot coming off. I am rounding the front corner in a little bit, just as I know that that's part of the detailing. So, you know, everyone has a different approach, but very often I do some checking using the scissor. Um, I think it has a lot to do with just the way I see hair and texture and control. Working over the top of the head here, elevating up and just lightly, gently checking through. Why over the head like this? It helps to uh, make it flatter. So when you check over the head like so, it helps to make the shape a little bit flatter because you're elevating it higher. And if you think about men's haircuts and men's work, the thing that uh, may be most important is that the sides can last a little bit longer. So in general, being able to pull those up over the head the way that I'm doing tends to sit them down a little flusher to the head. So again, an important step, I think, of, of most haircuts, unless it's a totally free-form sculpted haircut, um, is doing some checking. Going back through with your sections opposite to the original and just really making sure you're right on track. Elevate up a little. That's where my corner is. My corner will get a little bit softer from this, which is fine. We start off with a really strong corner and then we gently bevel it by checking through. And now the same thing through the back. I'll turn around to you guys this way. A little bit of heaviness there. That's where I was being extra careful when I started, right at the crown. But I think now I've got the confidence here. You can see a little bit of heaviness, thickness. You know, the consistency on these mannequins is really great because it's really like cutting real hair. I mean, it is real hair, 100% human hair, but the way that it's put onto the head and dis distributed is excellent. So I really feel like I'm getting that great practice in here. Checking my way through. All right, I think um, Harris was wondering, do you carry out online training sessions or maybe one-on-one? -on -one? Do you ever run courses over here in the UK? Uh, we have an online platform called hairbrainlive.me. You should go over there and check it out right now. It's something that we're putting really the majority of our energy into these days. Uh, we have currently over 30 hours worth of education there, filmed in an incredibly, incredibly high production value with many of the best educators in the world, including Sharon Blaine, Julian Perlingero, Lupe Voss, and uh, pretty soon, we'll have Jay Wesley Olsen and Chad Kenyon and DJ Muldoon, as well as the over 300 uh, Facebook Lives that we've done with myself and many, many artists all over the world. So yes, we do classes. Um, we've yet to come all the way over to the UK to do them, but perhaps we will. We do live classes, online classes, events. Hairbrain does a little bit of everything. All right, so you can see we've got this short kind of basic square layer. Now it's time to go in and start to kind of give it some more character. It's got texture, but we need more character. I'm gonna put a little bit of product in the hair. I'm gonna use a little bit of our friend uh, from Maverick, which is a great new kind of men's line. We use a little bit of the grooming spray. 
just to get a little texture happening so I can kind of start to imagine the finished style. Just create a little more product later, but I like to layer it in a little bit at a time. I'm going to switch back to the razor, and just right away I'm going to go to the edges of the cut here, and I'm going to start to use a little bit of a twist cutting technique to start to refine these edges. So coming in, now again I do want kind of a broken edge, that's what I'm going to go for here, a little twisting, and working from the left. A little twisting. Don't take too much because I don't want it too chunky. And I don't want to overly comb the hair at this point either. I want to take some small amounts and really just kind of refine. Why the twisting? It's going to make it even that much more DIY, you know, uh, because it'll make it a little, it protects some of the length in the inside of, this, of the section and makes it that much more irregular. And obviously that can be used on men, women. It can be used on anyone where you want that kind of irregular feeling on the edge. A little bit more in here. Just working that down a little bit at a time. We'll take a second to look in the mirror. Okay, now coming into the opposite side. So, you know, just in, for the sake of consistency of texture, I cut from the left on this side. I'll try to cut from the right on this side. Just kind of pushing all the hair in the same way. Does it make a difference if you're um, irregular in, in the way you cut? From like you just said, you you just cut from the left. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if it's the biggest deal in the world. It's not like a make or break of the haircut. But I think you know, whenever something kind of makes sense, it makes sense. So it kind of makes sense to me that you know, if I want it all pushing, we all we know short hair pushes long hair. So you know, if I work on the same direction on both sides, it seems like it would be easier to style and control. But it's not a scientific study, to be completely honest with you. And, you know, usually what I try to do is go through something once consistently and then break the rules. So once I've kind of done it all consistently, I'll come around, look into the mirror here, and now I can kind of do whatever I want because I feel like I've put a base in there. I'm going to lift this now, then I'm going to do some slicing internally using the blade, breaking this up. So using that backhand technique again, lifting, watch the razor come backhand and working these little series of concave short to long that will fall into this area. I want to protect the corner, so I'm going to do a lot of over-directing away from the recession area and come through and just kind of pop some more of that weight out. Is there another way to hold the blade that's not backhand but would give you the same effect? Um, you just have to hold it at a completely different elevation. I mean, you could come down this way and do it like this. So... You know, it, it, a lot of people don't do or haven't tried backhand. Um, that's why it's important to practice, because this is definitely something that'll broaden your repertoire with razor cutting. And there's no reason not to do it. If you practice it and you have good control with it, you might as well go for it. All right, I like what I'm seeing there in the front. Now I want to work around the edges. I also love this Maverick spray. It's definitely giving me the weight on the texture. Now I want to kind of work with some of that around the edges here. So again, we're trying to keep, you can see the shape. Again, it's got a nice squareness to it. It looks masculine to me, as opposed to a very curvy feminine short shape, but I still want kind of a broken kind of Paul Weller slash Oasis slash kind of Brit Pop outline, just for a change of pace. So coming in here and again, using that slicing technique. You can also use scissor. You can, you know, use whatever. I think a a great craft hairdresser who practices can use all kinds of tools interchangeably and have fun. Go with your feeling. Working a little bit over the ear. Again, not trying to create a completely clean opposite effect here. I want a little bit of a grown out ragged feeling over the ear. But still controlled and shaped in a way that makes sense. So it'll grow in well and it'll, it'll wear well for, for coal here. So sections parallel to the outline. I can pivot up a little bit into the shape to get some graduation on the edge, just a tiny bit. Again, I think that'll help this to last a little bit more and grow in without being so thick on the edge. 
So when when a man is going through like a radical makeover, like, you know, from very long hair to very short hair, what are some key points a hairdresser should think about in, in maintaining a masculine shape? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, I, first off, I'll generalize, but let's remember everyone's different. Everyone's bone structure is different. Everyone's needs and likes are different. But in general, maintaining corners in the crown at various lengths, corners at the temples at various lengths, tends to give a little bit more of a male shape. The idea is that it's, it's more square. It's leaner on the temples, leaner in the occipital bone, a bit taller and leaner um, in general. And that can happen at a lot of different lengths. Other than that, you know, it, it's really about you, your consultation, your communication. Um, I, I'm a big believer in images. I love when people bring photos. This way I can understand if they're either on track and understand what their hair does or what it doesn't do. And then we can have a realistic conversation. Um, and, you know, here's the thing that my friend Cassandra Platinum said recently on stage that was so brilliant and I, I, it stuck with me. You know, if someone does show you a picture that you know is totally not right for them or doesn't work, she said the next question she says is, you know, what else would you like if this didn't work for you? It's such a simple way of saying it, but it's such a graceful way. You know, are there other things that you might like if, if I thought that this didn't work for you? And actually, she said it even a little bit better than that. I don't want to misquote her, but I loved it. I never heard anyone say it exactly that way. But ultimately, you know, there's a few little basics. It's getting the texture, uh, the length right for the texture, because the worst thing that you can do is cut it to an uncontrollable length where perhaps in the crown or something, it just sticks up because, you know, even if it's everything else is great, that could definitely make the man feel like he's got a bad haircut. And the first thing people will say is, why is it sticking up? Which is, again, why I started right here. Because, you know, I want to make sure if that becomes uncontrollable, you know, even if you, because now I could play with it even a little bit more now that the shape is in. So I would, that's another thing I would recommend. Try to think about keeping it square and, and if possible, figure out a way that you can start on the top. You know, especially if you're not just, you know, buzzing the sides in the back. I can understand why you'd start there if you were just buzzing all that off. But if you're keeping a little more length, doing a little more men's grooming, I think you'll find it really helpful to get the style in and the length in on the top. Other than that, you know, a lot of it is going to be about very specific things. Here, over the comb a little bit, just kind of popping in a little more texture on the edges, graduating, breaking it up. Unless you're just going um, up and down with it, it seems. Yeah, just over the comb and the nape here, just to sit that in and break it up a little bit more. Obviously, you want to have good control and be, you know, delicate about it. It looks a little thicker, or maybe even a little bit longer in this area. So a little bit more. I can even get it back in my hands and do a little bit of what we call tipping. Same idea. But since it's long enough to grab, put some tension on. You know, then every once in a while I stop and take a look. I'm working my way all the way around the outline, so now I have to come to this opposite side. Again, just going for a short textured men's haircut, getting away a little bit from that totally kind of barbered look, which I love, and I think it's been popular, and I got a lot of practice more than I ever thought I would with clippers and that type of stuff. But I think, you know, something I haven't done in a while is this kind of more freeform um, kind of rocker edge for a man. So... That's something I wanted to practice on today. Get a little bit of separation on these edges. Delicate, you know, but using that very front corner of the sharp blade. Twisting when the length permits. And breaking up that edge. How do you protect yourself using the razor around the ear? You know, it's just learning. It's about having control, practicing your stroke. I can make my stroke very, very deliberate. I can cut very close to the ear. I know this is a mannequin, so, you know, big deal. But to be honest with you, watch, you know, I can touch myself with the blade here. You see, because I've got control over the two fingers, the thumb and the pointer finger. And just because the blade touches you doesn't mean it's going to cut you. If you drag it across or push it forward, it's more likely to cut. So it's really comes from practice. I can't tell you how many hours I practiced, especially when I first wanted to get into razor cutting how many mannequins I cut, how many things, how many people I watched and tried to emulate their technique. My friends from Bumble and Bumble, Nick Arojo, Rodney Cutler, you know, all these people that, you know, were doing incredible things. Howard McLaren, Raymond McLaren, 
And I was like, you know what? That's pretty cool. I, I haven't done that. I've been you know, doing things a certain way at Sassoon, which I loved, but I wanted to try some different stuff. Simona is wondering, um, how long should this haircut typically take? You know, it really depends. I mean, you know, I book all of my clients in the salon on the hour. Um, that gives me plenty of time to talk, to get to know them, to consult, to style, to personalize. I know that's not a reality for everyone. Some people have to, for a lot of reasons, work faster. And, uh, you know, if you practice a lot, maybe you can work faster. Um, without compromising the integrity of the work. So could I realistically see somebody doing this in 30, 45 minutes? Yes, I could, especially if it's something you've been practicing on a lot. I don't think that this kind of haircut is a 15 minute haircut, unfortunately. Um, and I, you know, it is just a level of detail that has to go into it that I can't imagine, you know, myself personally doing in less than 30 minutes. Um, and I don't know that I'd want to personally. I would just be too... It would feel more like work. Yeah, there you go. Switching to the scissor again now, a little more detailing. It's really pushing all that detailing on the edge. You know, and this is the basic shape you can get in pretty quickly. You know, it's whether or not you're going to sacrifice all these little details, the slicing, the channeling, twist cutting, things like that. And that's the next and maybe one of the last technical things I'm going to do is some twist cutting on the top. With the, with the scissor or the shear. So again, keep the length as it is, but break it up in a nice kind of random, somewhat erratic way. Open and close that scissor without closing it all the way. I'm getting lots of great texture in here. Check through, make sure you still have a shape. You can still see that line is there. It's still square on the ends, but there's a lot a broken texture on the inside, which is exactly what I wanted to have here. Coming back to address my corners, which should be softened or beveled from the way I checked over the head. I don't want to leave a harsh point on the on here. That's one of the things people get confused about. It's like it's square, I've got my corners, but if you leave the corner too solid, the hair won't grow in as well. So there's probably going to be a really strong corner right here in the crown because this is the most definitive place for that. So I want to make sure, you see this point right here, I want to break that up, bevel it a little bit, because that point will weigh the hair down quickly. It might make a wave if there's any kind of a wave pattern. So we really want to be conscious to keep the squareness, but lose the sharp point on the corner. And um, um, what kind of scissors are these? These are Yasaka dry cutting scissors. I, I've been playing with them, looking for an affordable alternative for dry cutting scissors or shears. I've seen, you know, and I use uh, beautiful ones that are in the thousand dollar range from BMAC, uh, but I know not everyone can afford that. So I talked to some of my contacts in Japan about what was an affordable dry cutting scissor, and this is so far something I've loved. I actually haven't put it down since I got it. Um, it's a Yasaka uh, scissor, dry cutting scissor. I believe it is retails for less than $400, which I know again is not cheap, but it's cheaper than a lot of what we're seeing out there. Um, so it's an affordable, great scissor and we'll have this available on Hairbrain Pro any day now. So just getting back in the mirror for the details on the front. You know, it's gotta be careful, anything that might be a little bit too much. I might, sometimes I'll even come back after all that texture and just do a little technical cutting because I don't want one or two pieces you know, not for this particular look. I mean, if you saw a good reason for that, you know, which I've seen some cool stuff like that where there's like a little kind of curl or something, but wasn't really in my plan for today. So I still want that square feeling coming through here, but broken. I think this crown where I left the most length, I can still come in and do a little bit more kind of um, twist cutting and back cutting. So, that's where I started the cut. That's where I was most conservative with my length. And now I feel like I can kind of work with it a bit to get it where it needs to be. Because I don't want it thick. I just don't want it to pop up uncontrollably. So twisting. And you know, going through technically for the first phase of the haircut allows me to have the confidence. I've exhausted my technique through basic cutting and cross-checking that now 
this is all for fun. I don't have to fix anything. You know, things are where they need to be in terms of the shape. Now it's about texture and style, movement, all that cool stuff. Working on the edges here, I'll use a little slicing. Just barely opening and closing the scissors with the flow of the hair, with the grain of the hair. A little bit here. You know, if you are practicing fading and barbering, I, you know, we did um, part of this series, we worked with Stay Gold, Sophie Pock, and she did a beautiful fade on one of the pivot point mannequins. And, you know, again, as I was saying, the way the hairlines are, it really allows you to get a true result, which I think is great because it can be really hard to practice barbering. It can be really hard to practice what I'm doing now, too. If the hair, some lesser quality mannequins, the hair just on the hairlines just stick straight out. If it doesn't lay down at all, you can't even practice this kind of stuff. And you know what? If you don't practice this, it's hard to get confidence because it can be kind of scary to do this free form stuff. So this is the Cole mannequin from Pivot Point, available at the Pivot Point shop. And thank you to Pivot Point for the continued support of our educational mission. We use Pivot Point mannequins in our online learning, online courses at uh, hblive.me because we really want to work with the best quality out there. Now just coming in, some of the final work here, and then I'm going to put a little more product in. Get a look in the mirror here. Okay, so I've had a little bit of the Maverick grooming spray, which is nice because it gave a little bit of weight and it got me starting to get the style happening. Now I'm going to go with Maverick dry paste which I've really been loving. It's a true dry paste. Really nice. The key with these kind of things, really emulsify it well in your hand, really break it down until you feel like it's almost disappeared. And then what I like to do is then use it up between the fingertip and the thumb to pull it in. You know, you, don't, you can't just put paste on the whole head and expect it to separate itself. I find that it's up to you to do the separating. And then you've got it in your palms, you bring it to your fingertips and you can do the separating. Push it into the hair, push it in, push it in. And this way the hair can take more product too because it's not just all lumped on in one place. So I go back for a little bit more. You know, I think when you're a craft hairdresser, craft barber, everything needs to be thought about. So even the way we do the product, take some Maverick dry paste, really break it up in your hands. Work it down to your fingertips, and now just with your fingertips, push it into the hair. I don't think any blow drying is necessary, really. You could if you wanted to wrap it or something, but I do think a few more well-placed snips now with the scissor, just to finish it off now that there's some product in there. So this way I'm just going to go in more at the root with the tip of the scissor and put a little bit more serrations over the hair that falls onto the face. It's obviously a big focal point of this cut. And anywhere I feel like maybe it's still a little too chunky, too thick looking because I wanted that to be broken up a bit more. And anywhere where I feel like I want to kind of get those edges down, just chisel them down a little. Hey, Steven. Thanks for tuning in here with us. Steven Stylins here. He's into it. Hey, Steven. Can't wait to come out and work with you. I know we've got something in the works. Steven uh, and Milo were here in the studio a few weeks ago and did a brilliant collab on Cut and Color. You guys can watch that at any time in our Facebook video section. Um, and I know that uh, I think Steven's going to get a model colored for me in the next couple weeks. I can come out there and try to work some magic. All right, so here we have it, a short textured men's haircut using the razor, kind of a basic square shape, then detailed with the scissor and the razor. I want to, of course, again, thank our friends at Pivot Point for their ongoing support of our educational community and for making such great tools for professionals who practice. Peace out, guys, and we'll see you real soon.